Good morning. We are looking at Colossians through this month, and as we do that, we're talking about Grace Church and, and what makes us tick, really, what makes us who we are. And today we are looking at what it means for us to be one family together. Now, I don't know that concept of family. I don't know what an average family is these days. The Simpsons were supposed to represent something of the average American family uh, at one point. You may remember that program, BBC 2.4 Children. It's slightly before my time, but I vaguely remember my older sisters watching it. It was supposed to represent something of an average family, 2.4 being the average number of children per household at the time. I don't think that is the average experience of family anymore. That the concept of family has different meanings for, for all of us and, and maybe doesn't have always positive connotations. For many of us, the concept of family will represent brokenness and, and struggle. So, so family may not be something to, to celebrate for some of us, but actually something that can be a bit of a struggle. So when we say for us to be an, a family as Grace Church, we can maybe think, well, is that even a good thing? What does that, what does that actually mean? How is it a good thing? That's what we'll look at. And I want to just clarify right off the top that I'm, I'm not talking about families as, as part of Grace Church, how we want lots of family to make up Grace Church. Like we, we do, but we want, we're all people. I'm talking about how we are one family. And that in, includes families. It includes single people. It includes couples, etc. In Colossians 2 is where, is where we're going to be. And I'm going to look at what makes us a family. How exactly are we a family? I've got one thing on that. And then what kind of family are we? I've got two things on that. And then we'll just look at what we're doing, this, this term really, and, and where we are now to be uh, emphasizing the importance of family within Grace Church. I'll start by reading Colossians from chapter 2, verse 6, and uh, we'll read bit by bit as we go, really. But this is verse 6 to 10. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. So, question, what makes us a family? How are we? We say we're brothers and sisters. How is that the case? What makes us not just a club, not even just a community together, but a family? The answer is Jesus. Jesus is the head of the family. We looked last week at how Jesus is, is, is the center of history. He is the one who holds it all together. And, and we get a similar verse today in the passage I just read, at end of verse 10. It says, he is the head over every power and authority. It is all about Jesus. Paul is at pains to make that clear to, to the Colossians. Paul, the writer, making it clear to the Colossians he's writing to that it is all about Jesus. And it's the same for us. And there's many reasons it's all about Jesus. One reason is that it's Jesus that holds us together. One of the verse from last week in chapter 1, verse 18 says, Jesus is the head of the body, the church. So another way to describe the church is as a body. We're, we're different. We've all got, we're all different parts of the body. Uh, we're diverse. Like my, my toenail is different from my tongue, but they both share the same head that is in charge of both of them. It's vital for us to remember that Jesus is our head. And for us to function as a family in a way that is good and positive, we must hold on to that. Individually and corporately, we start with and in Christ and we move forward with and in Christ. Think of an oak tree for a moment. This is an English 
oak tree to help illustrate this. Let me just read 6 and 7 again. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Plants, I'm not an expert on trees or plants or any of that, um, but I know this, plants and trees, trees are plants. <laughs> when we've, plants <laughs> grow down before they can grow up. And, and the tallest and the strongest trees have the, the deepest and the widest roots. So this is an English oak tree. The roots go, of an English oak will go deeper than its highest branches. And they will go, this much I know, right? This, this is, you can rest assured in this. They will go out two or three times wider than the radius of its leaves. And it can live for, over a thousand, for up to a thousand years, apparently. Hurricanes, right? They can't topple an established oak tree. It is deep. Now, the Colossians that Paul were writing to, in contrast, had become a little bit shallow. They, they were impressed by the outward appearance of some teachers who were, were not teaching truthful things in the church. They maybe had wise-sounding arguments and special knowledge, as people often have today, and the special inside information that you need. Uh, so, so the Colossians had received Jesus as Lord, but then they were putting their roots elsewhere, which ultimately didn't make them you know, open-minded and, and amazing, but, but shallow and less of a family together. What unites us as a church is that we have received Jesus Christ as Lord. We have become Christians. We've taken the name of the head of the family. We are stamped as, as Christians, Christians. And we now continue to live our lives in him so that we are rooted in him and that we grow up in him, both individually and corporately together. Our, our deep roots into Jesus mean that we can't be toppled individually or corporately. So whatever's going on right now in the world, we stand rooted deep into Jesus. And as a church, we hold tightly to that, that we are rooted in Jesus alone. We're not distracted by endless other voices or philosophies or worldviews that are coming from this, the elemental forces of this world, we, we hold to Christ as the head of the family and as the thing that makes us strong and the thing that makes us a family. And Paul then goes on to kind of really further outline this in verse 13, I'll read 13 to 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. It's like Paul's just further outlining what happens when we receive Jesus as Lord. Because he's saying the reason he does this is because if we want to make sure that we continue in Jesus and that we put our roots down into him, the way to do that really is to just to better understand what happened when we received Jesus as Lord. We never really move on from celebrating this salvation, just as we never move on from celebrating Jesus. So outside of Jesus, we were all dead in our sin. Our sin stood as a legal debt against God. And in our deadness, there was nothing that we could do about our indebtedness. But when we receive Jesus as Lord, God makes us alive with Christ. So just as Christ rose from the grave, we rise with him. And it means that he has forgiven our sins and cancelled the debt. He's nailed it to the cross. And Jesus actually hasn't just saved us from our own issues as Paul's saying, he's won a total and permanent victory of the, over the ultimate enemies that are sin and death. Gladiator is one of the greatest films ever. 
without question. There's a great moment at the beginning when he's still a, a, a Roman general, uh, and uh, he, they've just beaten the barbarian horde, and Maximus is shouting, Roma victor! And it's this amazing moment. And it means Rome is victorious. They, they've won again. But then they had to go and fight again. And eventually the Romans lost, right? Theologians summarize the, the message of these verses as Christus victor. Christ is victorious. And he is victorious forever. 15. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. A, a, a victory that, is, that will stand forever. And we forever celebrate that. In a few moments, we're going to celebrate some baptisms that happened in Grace Church, how some people have received Jesus as Lord. It's just it's so exciting as they share in this victory and, and celebrate Jesus and join the family. In, in getting baptized, they're, they're publicly demonstrating how they have come to do that, receive Jesus as Lord and accept that they need him to save them from, from sin and death. And they're committing to put their roots into him, continue in Jesus. And it's just a great reminder for all of us as we, as we watch this and, and engage with it. It's, it's amazing that it reminds us it's all about Jesus, right? And, and as a church, we are committed to help these people getting baptized to go forward in Jesus. So what makes us a family? Jesus. He unites us. He is the head. It's all about him. We are brothers and sisters together in Jesus. We share in his victory, one for us. So hopefully it's clear that it's all about Jesus for us. Hopefully they've made that clear enough. And it kind of also shows a little bit of what kind of family we are, right? We are one that always goes on about Jesus. So that's what makes us a family. Jesus is the head of the family. Two things on the kind of family we are. There are a lot more, but, but here's just a couple for today. Firstly, we are one diverse family. So we're one diverse family. It's both, right? We're one family together. We are all together in Christ. And we are a diverse bunch in Grace Church. There's two interesting in verses that, that Paul, the comments that Paul makes in this letter that, that work together. first one is in uh, chapter 3, verse 11, and he says this, Here in the church, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So there is no Jew or non-Jew, black or white, man or woman, young or old. Any barrier ha has been broken down in Christ, and we are one family together. Paul's clear on that. But then there's, there's also another verse in chapter 4, verse 11, a little bit more subtle. Paul's saying his final greetings, and he says this, Jesus, who is called Justice, different Jesus, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. So Paul's saying that there's not many Jews among his co-workers and those who are have proved a particular comfort to him, and that's okay. So in one breath, there is no Jew or Gentile, and, and in another, I'm particularly comforted by my Jewish brothers. We want to be one family. We are, right? We are one family but we want diversity in the family. And we don't want to just kind of accept that. We want to celebrate that. In recent months, the discussion around racism has, has increased in, in prevalence, and it's good, and it's so important to us as a church that we approach this conversation rightly and, and wisely and, and join in the fight against racism. There's a book, uh, an excellent book, that we need to talk about race, Understanding the black experience in white majority churches, which is what we are at the moment, a white majority church. And it's a helpful book to read. And uh, the guy, Ben Lindsay, writes it, just some helpful comments along these lines. He says, God loves all people the same, judges all people the same, and holds all people to the same holy and moral standards, regardless of their skin tone. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for all without distinction of color. While this is all true, we cannot ignore the other end of the spectrum. 
we cannot and should not ignore, disregard, or overlook how God made each of us individual. He quotes guy Isaac Adams says, we love people less when we ignore how God made them. Although as Christians our absolute identity is in Christ, we are to navigate ways of retaining the consciousness of people's identifiers. Otherwise, misunderstandings happen and opportunities to learn from those with different experiences are missed. So, so there's, there's two ends of the spectrum. We can either be just so obsessed, well, we're all, well there's, no, there's no difference, we're all one in Christ, that we, we're just kind of blind to any differences and we, in an unhelpful way, or we can become too color conscious, if, if you want, and, and to, to trying to, to celebrate diversity too much. We need to find a happy middle ground, and Paul seems to be clear on this. Ultimately, we are one family, but God has made us different to one another. And what is diversity, and how can we celebrate it if we don't start by recognizing it among us? And diversity is not just about race and skin color. We, we want to be one diverse family in every regard, and th- the same principle applies in every way that you could distinguish between people. So in one sense, w- we don't care what age you are or, or, or what gender you are, what marital status you have or how able-bodied you are or, or how many kids you do or don't have. Everyone is, is welcome. What, what unites us is Jesus and nothing else. But at the same time, we really care about all those things. And we particularly want older people in our church. And we particularly want younger people in our church. We particularly want single people in our church. And we particularly want married people and family units. And we want to fight to get that diversity and then celebrate it. So that we're not just a, fa- a church that really we're a church for families. And if you're you know, single, you can come along and join it. No, no, we want to celebrate everything that we are a church for, for, for everyone, every people group. And within reason, it's okay to particularly identify with other people who are similar to you in whatever way or who have a similar background to you, just like Paul did. And he particularly comforted by his Jewish brothers that's okay to an extent, always remembering that we, we don't want any cliques in, in Grace Church. We are one family together. Christ is all and is in all. And what kind of family are we? We are Grace family. All that stuff that Jesus has done for us by saving us from sin and death and making us alive with him and part of the family We haven't earned any of it. It is all done by grace alone. We have not earned a thing, nothing. And the Colossians weren't denying that they were saved by grace, but kind of having been saved by grace as they moved forward, they lived as if they needed to abide by a bunch of human rules. I'll read uh, 2 verse 20. It says, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly earthly things. Sometimes I think it would just be easier, you know, if we just had a church policy about everything. We just write up a nice list of rules on how we relate to one another. And, you know, you want to be part of Grace Church, part of this family. This is how you want to relate to all the people in it. But that, that, that would be wrong. It's not how we roll as a church. We, we don't have rules. We've been saved by grace. And we want to live by grace, demonstrate the, the grace of God that has been given to us, demonstrate that to others. It's linked to how we are one diverse family together, right? We... As a church, we fight for a culture of come as you are. 
Everyone is welcome as part of Grace Church. You are so welcome to be joining with us this morning. And I'm sad I can't see you and, and, and join with you in that way, but you are so welcome to join in. We can't, you, you come as you are, whoever you are. We, we don't believe that you will stay the same as God works in you and, and, and as you join the family, but everyone is welcome just as they are with all their baggage and mess. We don't love people or, or serve people or care people, care for people based on anything but grace. We don't, you know, help those who help themselves is, is our approach. No, we help and love all. I love, I love hearing about how people in Grace Church look out for or, and care for other people in Grace Church. And it's happening all the time. I'm hearing so many little anecdotal things, particularly in recent months, of how people have just been helping out. How a life group has just got around someone and, and is caring for them and loving them. Uh, and, and, you know, doing things like meal rotors, providing a meal for them for, for a period of time once a day. It's not like, it's, it's not, if you have X disease, then you will qualify for one meal rotor for a period of seven days. And if you receive one meal rotor, you will automatically be subscribed to provide a meal in the following three meal rotors. That is, that's not how it goes. We don't love one another or serve one another based on how much that we think they deserve it, how much we think they've earned our love. No, we do it based on what God has done for us and based on how much we didn't deserve it, so we extend grace in the same way way. We are grace family. So what makes us family? Jesus is the head of the family. What kind of family are we? We're one diverse family. We are grace family. So what are we doing then right now with, with everything that's going on, with all the restrictions in place to cultivate that culture, to show how family is a high value for us? I just briefly mentioned life groups, how smaller groups within church who get around and see each other regularly and care for one another. And when we're in this position we're in with everything going on, we are not about to reinvent the wheel. Life groups have always been vital to us as a church, the backbone of who we are, that they're how we have these big values and then apply them in the day-to-day -day reality of life. Life groups remain so important. And the Grace Center is available to use for, for life groups where the group exceeds six people and measures need to be taken. You know, when, when, when we come in here and face masks and, and other things that will be explained. But, but it's here, right? The, the Grace Center is here to be booked and used so that you can meet in person. And it's all a bit trying to keep up with all the, the latest guidelines, aren't we? So currently now, you can meet in sixes, no more than six, in gardens, but also inside now. Uh, it, all a bit subject to change, but that's what we're, we're at now in terms of life groups. What is clear is that online for life groups in some ways is going to remain important. Now, I'm not saying that life group online is as good as normal when we're in person, but it is better than nothing. I don't know if you've ever had anyone in your family or a really close friend move abroad and and so when you often use Skype or FaceTime or whatever to, to keep in contact with them. If you've ever done that, I've never heard anyone say, do you know what, yeah, they did that, they moved abroad, we, we just FaceTime them, and it's fine. I, it's exactly the same as being a person. I don't miss them at all. It's exactly the same. We all know it's not quite the same. But at the same time, I, I don't know people who just say, yeah, I just can't cope with FaceTime. With, I just, I can't, it doesn't work for me, so I don't bother. I, I, we just don't keep in contact anymore. No, no, no. You still fight for it, don't you? It, it's worth fighting for and going for, even though it can be tough at times. I'm going to try and help life groups in a way as well to just be accessible in, in a new way online. Meeting is important, whether that's offline or online. But a relationship is also more than that in life groups. It's praying for things, praying for individuals together when things are going on, getting updates via email or WhatsApp or whatever, and praying through things together as a group. These are important for us. We need to fight for these things. And we want to push, uh, as, a, as a church, for a generally intentional hospitality among us. 
So, so there are things we can't do because of the guidelines. I don't need to tell you that. But what can we do? And what, what's the, you know, what are these new things? What does it all mean for us? Keep updated. Keep thinking creatively. Six people maximum, but six people from any households is fine, in indoors or outdoors now. Let's do what we can to make the most of that. Living our lives together where possible. So, if, you know, obviously it depends on how big your family is already at the moment, but if, if it's possible for you with the, with the number limits, invite people around, right? It doesn't just start doing life together. It doesn't have to be for a roast dinner. Invite them around for a bacon butty or for cornflakes or whatever. Just let's be uh, being intentionally hospitable to one another. Those of us in families who've got the space, let's be particularly mindful of those on their own or, or in households with no other people from Grace Church for whom it's just trickier to access everything online. Let's do it, let's do it particularly when there is online stuff to access, whether it's a, a prayer meeting or these more Grace things we're doing on Wednesday, if you've got, again, the numbers fit in your household, think of, a, of someone you can invite around for these things. Particularly when we're praying together, it's really helpful to be with other people. David's trying to come up with a name for inviting people around to watch stuff online. He's, he's called it Meet In To Praise Him. I mean, leave your rating in the comments or whatever. I'd, or if you can come up with a better name for, for such a thing, then let us know. That'd be great. Another thing, YA, our, our young adults are doing adopt a student. So there's new students coming to the university soon. Um, and you can ad adopt one, sort of, you know, and then just start to look out for them, build a relationship with them, have, again, have them around uh, where possible. Get involved with these things. Think along those lines. It doesn't have to be a formal adopt a student, adopt anyone. Let, let's be loving one another and uh, fighting for community. We are still not meeting on Sunday mornings. We're still constantly assessing it, but we're not at the moment. So we just cannot get community in that way, in a way that we normally would. So, that, so it doesn't mean we just give up on it. Now we have to fight even harder than we normally would in order to be a family together because we are a family in Christ. There's um, one more verse I didn't read uh, at the beginning of chapter 2. Which verse 2 of chapter 2 says this, just as I, as I land and close. Paul says, my goal is, so this is kind of the point of the letter that he's writing to the, to the Colossians. He says, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. He says, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. His goal is that the Colossians are united and encouraged. That's what we're talking about. And then he says, so that ultimately they may know Christ more. Now, I kind of would expect that to be the other way if you think about it. He expects, I want you to know Christ more so that you are more united, which is true. And that's kind of what I was talking about earlier. As we worship Jesus more, remember he's the thing that unites us we become more united. He's saying, well, no, just be united in love and you will know Jesus together. He's emphasizing it the other way. The more that we are one family together, the more we value that, the more we fight for that, the more we know Jesus. <laughs> and it is all about Jesus. I'm just going to pray for us that we would be united so that we would know Jesus better as um, we would be united as one family. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your grace to us. You have loved us and given your son and saved us, not because of anything that we've done, but because of your grace. I pray that we would be united together as one family. Thank you that we are a family. We're distant, but we are a family together. Just as if a brother moves to Australia and you keep contact via Skype, you're still a family. We are still a family, even though we may feel like we might as well be on the other end of the world. We're a family together. I pray that you would unite us. Would we be supernaturally bonded together? Even through what, all that's going on right now in these crazy times, would we be more united than ever by, by a work of your spirit, by a miracle of your spirit? Would you unite us so that we may know Jesus better? 
What a beautiful truth that as we are united more, we know Jesus more. I pray, do it, Lord. Would we be more united? Would we know Jesus more as one family together? For the sake of your name, we pray. Amen. Amen.